Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Lemus, and welcome to our Scholars of Color event. It's our first ever event that we are actually having. So I'm super excited to go ahead and get the ball rolling on this wonderful panel made up of these wonderful human beings. And as we go through the event, we want to go ahead and actually start off with some ground rules. So today, you are here joining us for Redefining Scholars, a panel on resilience, community, and leadership. It is a panel made up of wonderful human beings that we're going to go ahead and get a chance to go ahead and introduce to you all. You're going to get also a good overview of what the Scholars of Color platform is. Some of you may be brand new to what this platform is, so we want to make sure that we go ahead and do a really good introduction of it, an overview, maybe also ways for you to go ahead and potentially get involved. The intention of today is to really give folks a good understanding of why this platform even exists and where we want to go ahead and take it into the future. So thank you all for being with us. This is a partnered event with a platform called the Z Factor Project, which we'll also be discussing and actually sharing a really, uh, really impactful video from Andre, the founder of the Z Factor Project. So our agenda today is a welcome and an introduction of Scholars of Color and the Z Factor Project where it's also a presentation of our wonderful panelists, some of which you can also already see here in the gallery view. And then we're gonna go ahead and just do a quick break, let people go ahead and get a stretch if they need to get some water. And then we're gonna go ahead and see a video that actually got shared with us by Andre again of the Z Factor Project. And then at the very end, there is gonna be some time for Q&A, but if you do have questions, please throughout the presentation, you are more than welcome to go ahead and throw that in the chat. And we'll go ahead and either answer those via chat or there will be an opportunity to go ahead and answer those live. And of course, I want to go ahead and show some gratitude or some acknowledgments at the very end of the presentation as well. So as far as a welcome, so I wanted to go ahead and just take this as an opportunity to go ahead and also share with you all what Scholars of Color is. It is a branch of a platform in a business called Reclaiming Your Happiness with Lemus LLC, which I'm the founder and CEO of. And the platform is an inclusive platform and business dedicated to helping people find their voice, reclaim their happiness, and align themselves with their life goals. I'm a really big believer that we all have magic to go ahead and offer the world. And it is part of my duty and part of my passion to go ahead and help people discover that. Or in, sometimes it's actually about rediscovering that purpose, what it is that makes them happy, what it is that makes them feel fulfilled so that they can also go ahead and progress in whatever goals they actually want to go ahead and pursue. So Scholars of Color, as I mentioned earlier, is a branch of this platform and it aims to redefine the word scholar. And the idea there is that we're really wanting to make that word scholar to be more inclusive because traditionally, even when this platform actually launched, actually launched two years ago, a lot of the people that were actually coming our way had questions around the actual platform. They're like, well, if I don't have a degree, am I actually allowed to be in this space? Can I actually be showcased if I don't have a master's degree? So I was getting a lot of those questions and it made me really think long and hard. It's like, is this an inclusive platform if people are actually asking whether or not they can even be included if they don't have an advanced degree? And that's when we actually changed up the game. We're like, we need to go ahead and redefine this word and look at scholar in a different way. And so for us today in this current day, two years later, scholar is really someone that has something to offer the world, to go ahead and teach the world. We want to amplify the voices of scholars of color from all sorts of industries. So that could be folks in education, it could be in the STEM related fields, it could be people in government, it could be people that are in spirituality or entrepreneurs. The whole point is that we want to go ahead and amplify the voices of people of color. That is really the, the, the center of what we're doing here and the work that we want to go ahead and progress in because we deserve to be celebrated and the work that we put in, which oftentimes, unfortunately, goes unseen, this whole purpose and this platform really aims to go ahead and shake things up and really make it loud that we are here and that we also have a lot to offer the industries that we're a part of, but also the world as a whole. And so again, we aim to go ahead and bring in people from diverse backgrounds. At this point, we actually have over a hundred scholars of color, some of which are actually on here. I was able to see the participants. Um, so I also wanna go ahead and use this as an opportunity to go ahead and say thanks to all of the people that have actually taken a chance on Scholars of Color, that have been part of the platform, that have jumped on with us and to create this event. I wanna give a big shout out to our panelists here, our interns and everyone else that is part of this community. All right, so the Z Factor project. So the Z Factor project was actually something that was created by Andre Zarate. 
And Andre is actually a former coaching client of mine. And he also is someone that is part of the Scholars of Color platform. He is amazing. You will get his contact information at the end of this presentation after you watch his video. But essentially what he's doing is he's aiming to go ahead and actually create an institution school for young students of color that identify within the LGBTQIA spectrum. And he really wants to go ahead and address that, you know, address that you know, head on and really also get the support from people from different industries to go ahead and help in this venture. And so the Z Factor project was founded by Andres Zarate, who is a middle school educator and is again, wanting to develop a micro lab for students of color who identify as LGBTQ+. So today you decided to go ahead and join us here. Thank you for taking your time for our Scholars of Color Presents Redefining Scholars, a panel on resilience, community, and leadership. Again, this is a partnered event with the Z Factor Project. So we're gonna jump right in and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists before we actually go into the official panel. So Melissa Muganzo Murphy is the CEO of Muganzo Entertainment and the executive producer of, and I apologize, Melissa, please feel free to correct me if this is the big histo or the big histo, I'm not sure, so I apologize for that, but a documentary. And Melissa is the CEO, again, of Maganzo Entertainment, and she, they are passionate about Black student recruitment, retention, academic financing, and career attainment, as well as Black women's health and the Black dollar. Henry Ortiz is, Henry, Henry Ortiz is at community, he's a community healer at Community Healers Incorporated and is a community advocate and healer, and is the founder of Trauma Through a Traumatized Perspective Training Program. Henry is passionate about serving his community, playing the guitar, and writing songs as well. All right, Daniel Cano is a recording artist at Sena Daniel Cano, and he is passionate about healing people of color through ancestral modalities, debunking veganism, youth empowerment, and leadership development and also addressing mental health through creative arts and leveraging the power of hip hop to heal ourselves, ancestors, animals, and the planet. All right, and Dr. Katira Asil Tarverdian, I apologize again if I don't get the name correctly, please feel free to correct me later, um, also goes by Kat, is the assessment and evaluation analyst at CSU Channel Islands and is passionate about disaggregating Asian data that will ensure evidence-based equity provisions for this diverse community at local, state, and federal levels of institutionalism, as well as the experience of Afghan women in the US. All right, so at this point, we're gonna go ahead and actually get started with the panel. Let's go ahead and actually pull up these questions here. And basically this is gonna be the larger portion of the event. We really wanna go ahead and get to know our panelists and really get a chance to really connect to them and see the wonderful work that they are doing. They were all selected for a reason because they're all incredible human beings. And so we really wanna make sure that we're highlighting their work um, and also why they actually got connected to the actual Scholars of Color platform. So we're gonna jump right in. I'm gonna go ahead and get these questions here. We'll go ahead and actually stop screen sharing at this point. So that way you can go ahead and see the beautiful faces of the people that are gonna be talking to you about their experiences. I'll go ahead and get started and actually I'll pick on the first initial person. And if you all want to go ahead and popcorn over to the next panelist, feel free to do that. So first off, of course, number one, please introduce yourself, your title and why you decided to be part of the Scholars of Color platform. So why don't we start off with Melissa and then we can go ahead and popcorn over to the next person. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me. Again, my name is Melissa Muganzo Murphy. My pronouns are she, they, and sis, and I'm the CEO of Muganzo Entertainment. I'm super proud of this platform. And I decided to be a part of it because I thought it was important to bring visibility and awareness to a number of folks that identify as first generation that have done the very brave thing and gone through higher education and still found joy and celebration in their identity and making ways to combine their history and all of the ways in which they impact the world to be able to bring that into mentorship in the form of um, student affairs, higher education, community organizing, you know, mentoring folks that are, are right behind us. So I'm very proud of this platform. I'm very, very honored to be here. Thank you, Melissa. And if you want to pick on one of the other panelists, they can go ahead and go next. Yes, 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 yes. Let's go ahead and go with Daniel. Peace, y'all. Thank you for the time passing, Melissa. Sorry if you hear my dog in the back. She's just very protective. <laughs> um, Daniel, he, him, his, a recording artist with Senna Daniel Cano. 
Um, I did spend some time doing higher ed, uh, student affairs work, as well as to organizing statewide within California. Um, but the reason why I wanted to get involved with Scholars of Color really is to um, just connect with other innovators, disruptors, and trailblazers of color, um, and to know that in the ways that we've created our own path, whether it's through an institution, um, college, or a company, but folks who are really like learning how to be entrepreneurs and being their own bosses. Um, and that's, you know, how that leads to building our own wealth in the ways that we feel like um, is painting the picture and not even just painting it, but materializing it, actualizing the future that we do need um, and is critical for all of us. And to me, that always entails incorporating healing modalities and music, um, of course. And I will pass it to Dr. Kat. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to speak during this platform. Um, my name is Dr. Katera siltar and I go by Kat. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Assessment and Evaluation Analyst at the Division of Student Affairs at Channel Islands. Um, I decided to be a part of the Scholars of Color platform because it's I'm an invisible Asian, it, you know, Afghan to be exact. I'm a first generation and only college graduate in my family. I'm the daughter of Afghan immigrants. I'm a first time mom to a beautiful little boy who's half Afghan and half Iranian Armenian. Um, I'm an active advocate for Afghan people, namely women in the LGBT, LGBTQIA plus community. Um, you know, that said, the representation of scholars of color is really important to me. It's a platform that allows historically marginalized, especially invisible populations to feel a sense of belonging, um, to have a space where scholars of color can namely be open and, you know, kind of share their lived experiences, cultures, histories. Um, it's beautiful, it's empowering, and I think that that's necessary. A lot of institutions of education, um, you know, they increase cultural competency about different first immigration populations and representations of scholars of color. It'll kind of help build, connect, and empower those communities, right? Um, you know, in the U.S., scholars of color are on the rise, right? Paired with immeasurable levels of educational attainment for many of those populations, I think it's we need to have a better understanding of education and transforming experiences of those students of color, the scholars of color particularly, in order to provide more effective educational programs for those who are navigating the US educational system. So for me, I, you know, it's a wonderful platform and it's a great place to be able to speak on and, and raise awareness. So I appreciate it. And I will throw it over to Henry. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Henry Ortiz. Uh, I formerly incarcerated uh, um, during my efforts in there. I, I did a lot of work around trauma and uh, helping a lot of our men who were written off as murderers, uh, as baby pre predators that were written off based on the era where it was, you know, Tupac music, Snoop Dogg. It was gang banging to the fullest, Bloods, Crips, Sureños, Norteños, all that good stuff, right? So our, our, our violence, some say that we were the, the most violent uh, uh, era of teenagers in all human evolution, uh, you know, according to some research, right? I don't know how true that was, but the influence uh, was high. Uh, the amount of, of, of drugs that were coming into our communities th through, you know, some of these government agencies and, and, and all these different uh, weapons that made it all of a sudden to our communities where now you're taking multi-generational trauma, you know, children that come from uh, ancestry of, of enslavement uh, to, to the Euro, Euro Anglo Saxons and the conquest of, of our native land and, and sometimes kidnapping other people from other countries to work us all collectively here and oppress us to build a country that just treats us in, uh, like they're world country citizens in our neighborhoods of color. And so I grew up in that era uh, and, and went to prison for manslaughter, gang enhancement, uh, you know, was shot at 16. Uh, I grew up with a lot of years of physical abuse as a child. And so as a result, I developed a lot of anger and rage. And so hurt people hurt people. I took that hurt and that rage after getting tired of constantly getting jumped because I didn't like to back down from nobody. So I was fighting a lot. So, you know, I had to join a gang to survive the streets. And that became my passion and I went full force and destroyed my, 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 my young years, half of my life. You know, at 18, I went to prison and spent half of my life in there. And uh, I got off of parole uh, three years ago. I'm going on my fourth year in November. And uh, we were able to bring uh, in there. I was able to start an organization called Self-Awareness and Recovery to help our men heal because they didn't know how to articulate why they created such great harm. And so I took them deep into the core essence, work curriculums and uh, got connected to a lot of authors of evidence based uh, teachings like, you know, and also books like The Four Agreements and 
was able to expand and take those efforts now here. And uh, eventually I left the organization. I work with all of us Fernanda, as a, a chapter organizer. And also, I'm also the founder of, of a newly uh, started organization, nonprofit uh, called Community Healers, in which we're going to continue going back into the schools, working with our populations impacted by crime and uh, uh, also working with the court systems to uh, uh, decarcerate and uh, uh, identify alternatives to incarceration through our networks. Uh, and also uh, expanding education efforts as in prison, I educated myself uh, after flunking the second grade and never feeling like I, I could concentrate in school or make it in school. I, I you know, in prison, I, I, I drove myself to educate myself just on, on a natch, you know, with, on my history, my culture, social justice, and eventually it took the passion of go to college and advocated to expand, uh, you know, our college program to where we had 3,500 people on the waiting list uh, in that whole space. And uh, a lot of these men, I've, we've brought them home. I've, I've mentioned coming out here, I've been able to get them housing through my networks. Uh, I place them in, in, in school or job placement or support groups all throughout California through the partners. And so the reason why I'm in this space is because I know that in order to defeat this problem of white supremacy and the systems that hold us down, that are a threat to me every day, that trigger the post-traumatic stress that I suffer every time I see a cop, you know, just today in South Sac, instead of letting that cop go behind me, I'm going to turn right before you. And I'm just going to, you know, like, and I'm not even doing anything, but that's how I've been conditioned because these are the slave captures that have been it's enslaving me for 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 and, and taking me constantly to these systems and so you know i i carry a lot of trauma uh, on that i'm aware of it but i'm a, i'm also a, a mentor to a lot of people out here because i understand my trauma and 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 i and, and engage in discussions of community healing uh where able to understand each other's trauma and grow together uh and transcend uh the the barriers of our ego that sometimes is rooted on hurt and pain so that's why I'm here to connect with community, to build partnerships and uh, to expand our efforts of social justice, uh, you know, in every space that we're at, you know, so a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I, I'm hoping that the audience can really just feel into the energy that is here. I learned something new about just the folks on the panel every single time that I meet with them. And I think what's common just across all four of them is that the passion, the passion is there. And I really appreciate it. I think something that you all touched on was, you know, some form of healing. And the reason why we do the work that we do is not just about us. It impacts so many other people. It impacts people that came before us. It impacts people that are coming after us. And it really is a community-based platform. And so being able to be connected to a community like this, like Scholars of Color, makes it that much more important because we really do have power in the words that we use, in the spaces that we occupy, and how we actually navigate the world. You know, just being able to even have access to spaces like this, you know, I am, I'll just speak for myself, I'm just so honored and privileged to share space with you all and to just be in community with folks like you all because there's so much magic in the world. And unfortunately, like I said at the very beginning, some of that goes unseen and overshadowed by a lot of other entities. And really, I think, having platforms like this makes it that much more focused on us, on people like us who have stories to tell, who have magic to go ahead and share with the world. So I appreciate you all sharing that. Leading right into this, some of you already touched on this, but I think it's a perfect moment to go ahead and go into our second question. So as we think about resilience, leadership, and community, what has been your biggest challenge thus far and how did you overcome it? So we'll go ahead and start off with Daniel this time and we can continue the popcorn system. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, so when I was like going through the questions and writing down, okay, what are my my points? This one to me that was like easily came out was faith. Um and, and believing and knowing that that you are, we all are protected and supported at all times, even when we don't feel like it. Um and just last night before I was going to bed, um, I did some prayers and then I like meditated and then I saw like um, an Aztec pyramid. Um and to me, it reminded me to always remember that, yes, I'm in this physical body, but I'm also a spiritual being and that I have a lineage of spiritual warriors within me. So whenever my mental health or my brain and mind tries to play tricks because of the conditioning of white supremacy and capitalism, um, that I can discount it and be like, this is just the naysayers. This is just things try to bring me down. You could call it demons, you can call whatever you want. But that is the distraction. And it's, it's try, it was trying to pull me away from the purpose. And so for me, it's just um, always having faith. Um, in the little moments that you're able to conquer a fear that feels comfortable for you, like 
to be able to take those steps. Um, and it looks different for everybody. And so, and one thing that happened this year for me was like, I think there's a quote that says, uh, rejection as redirection, right? Um, but I didn't go to a point where I was getting rejected. I got to a point where I had to get redirected, where I was not taking care of my health and I burned out because of the exploitation of capitalism, right? And, you know, higher power God was like, you need to slow down. And reminding us that we have that power and we deserve to slow down and to rest despite as things are kind of like, quote unquote, a new normal and opening back up. We have, what did you learn in the time when we had to be in, right, indoors? And how can we apply that now so that we're really restructuring in the ways that we can that is sustainable for our spirit? And so I think that's what I really wanted to come through and share with that rest is, I don't wanna say productive, rest is necessary. Um, and so in the ways that we can do that, um, please, please take that time. Uh, pass it to Melissa. That is such a great question. I'm gonna be very honest about this question. One of the hardest things about um, becoming an entrepreneur out of leaving a system that was guaranteed and safe was funding. That's one of the hardest things for people to find um, when they branch out on their own. Um, the other thing that I know I personally faced imposter syndrome about is especially coming out of a very layered system like student affairs or higher ed is knowing that my name alone carried its own weight. I didn't need the backing and the approval of all these different departments, of all these different people above me, supervisors, directors, vice presidents, presidents, to say, yes, that is a great idea. Yes, that is good. Yes, we should move forward. It was like, if I said it, then that's what's happening. If I funded it, then that's what's happening. That's it. And that was reaffirming for me as someone that has always been a creative my entire life to say that I'm good enough all on my own right? It was um, a way for me to check in about my confidence, about my ability and my agency and my reach, really be able to assess the network in which I claim to have, um, activate my own power within myself. And all of that was really groundbreaking. So some of the hardest things for me was being able to find, again, funding on my own and being able to believe in myself without this backing or this government or institutional name to say, yes, this person is smart, capable, able, a doer, right? Um, just being, again, trained for the past 15 years working in these systems and these agencies, which for a long time can make you feel like nothing um, can be done if someone doesn't say, yeah, that's a cool idea, a cool idea, or yeah, we should totally do that. Um, and so anyone that's out there that's thinking, wow, I have a really great idea, um, and I just need somebody else to tell me, yeah, that is a great idea. It's totally imposter syndrome. It's totally imposter syndrome, and it's the conditioning of you thinking you need this group or this agency or this backing um, in order to be great. But in reality, you were born perfect. You were born capable. You were born re ready. And as Daniel said, you have a history of warriors who have gone to bat for you so that you can be capable and be able to navigate the life that we live in now. So for anybody that's out there that has an idea or um, a way in which they would like to move forward in life that's different than where they are now, you should totally go for it. Um, and in those moments of um, doubt or frustration to remember that you were already born capable. You were already born capable. And I will pass it over to Dr. Kat. Wow, oh, how do you follow that? That was beautiful. Um, this, was, this was, to be honest, a really difficult question for me because when I think of my population, you know, I know resilience screams out. Leadership and community, not so much, right? When I think of resilience, I really kind of dug deep and I thought, the living and surviving of 50 years of war just makes us that much more resilient, right? We're still there. We're still trying to be heard. Um, but I think of the women in my family. I think of my grandmother. You know, she was the first woman to remove her scarf back home. She was one of the first women to travel to the Czech Republic to perform for the Tsar, for people like Indira Gandhi, Lance Armstrong. She was a pioneer, a feminist. My mother, she left everything behind, everything she knew um, at 21, she strapped six milk bottles in her belt and trekked those Hindu Kush mountains to get me a better life. You know, I think of all of that. I think of the individuals of scholar who have gone through oppression, trials, tribulations, trauma, and are still standing. To me, that's the resilience, right? Um, I think of myself. I came to this country with no real outreach or support. I'm navigating this U.S. educational system 
by myself. I've never professionally or academically been able to identify with any one person. You know, having no sense of belonging and trying to navigate that. Um, I remember a time of going back home and teaching children English and going through when the Taliban came through to try to put down the school and actually being stabbed through it, not telling family that that happened, being able to make sure I got back home to be able to still continue giving to that community. I think all of that is resilience. Um, I think the biggest challenge thus far is being heard. Um, we're an invisible population, right? We truly haven't really been seen or heard. It's only really what you see on the surface level as far as the media. Um, I know when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, the US Census had us under an ancestry. We're not even considered an ethnicity or a race. Um, the erasure of being identified through this AAPI umbrella. Um, our LGBT community, it's taboo. It's not even spoken of. It's imperative to respect and honor those lived experiences working with those individuals that are Afghan and transgender, being able to help them through the trauma, the experience of not only cultural um, oppression, religious oppression. I mean, there's so much there that isn't really tapped on. They have so much to tell. Um, so I don't think necessarily we've overcome anything yet. I think it's still something we're challenged with each and every single day. Um, there is no true leadership when it comes to our community in any sense of the word. We advocate at the individual level. So that said, I'm just hoping to continue listening to my inner voice and advocating and not really listening to the random opinion of others and just trying to continue on that fight that we're all trying to have for all of our populations, really, just as a scholar of color. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over again to Henry. In regards to, to, to my biggest barrier, I think, uh, uh, I know what the problems are in my community. Uh, I, I know what the solutions are too. A lot of us do across the country, but we, we, we don't have funding because you can't hold the volunteer accountable to put in the work that's necessary to make the changes. Since I've been out, I've been putting in work. And as a result, I'm suffering from health issues because I was overworking myself. I went through, uh, you know, six burnouts out here, you know, but I kept pushing through, went through uh, poly COVID, poly had it like about three, four times when it first kicked off and we were kicking off the George Floyd protest and, and, and making sure the pressure kept going and making sure we pushed AB 392 when we got arrested with the Stefan Clark protest, making sure we did a lawsuit. And so on every freaking level, every forefront, the pressure has to be implemented now because the needs been on us. We got to take that knee and apply that knee a little pressure somewhere else uh, so, so some folks can understand what we've went through all this time, you know, and, and educate these people that work for these systems so that they can start, uh, you know, uh, uh, breaking, the, breaking these systems and developing new models, because that's what it's going to take in order to create effective practices. But when you ain't got the money to do your own research, uh, to hire your own team of organizers, your team of, of, of legal advocates, uh, policy organizers, uh, you know what I'm saying? And, and just community uh, organizers and community healers healing the community and, and then youth mentors. You know, it's, it's, it's hard when you're having to do all those hats by yourself or a limited team. You know what I'm saying? But uh, the good thing is that uh, uh, we're, we're being heard loud and clear. We're shaking and we're rattling cages all the way from the state capitol with our legislators. You know what I'm saying? We had some success with, uh, you know, the, the fines and fees campaign and, 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 you know, little by little decriminalizing all these different systems that our people have been subjected to, you know, and ending things like, uh, you know, uh, all these mandatory sentences, uh, uh, you know, these enhancements that add so much outrageous time to people of color. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, support to get funding for, for better representation instead of these overworked public defenders that, that just show up and, and meet with your client five minutes before your hearing and then, you know, try to push them to get a deal, uh, you know, because otherwise the system will retaliate on you and, and hang you and give you multiple life sentences. That's what the system has done to our people. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, you know, working around issues around ICE and deportation and the injustices of just taking somebody and kidnapping them away from their family without a, a due process, without a dignified way of transitioning. Uh, uh, once all litigation has been exhausted, without considering the impact that it's going to have in that community, the family, you know what I'm saying? And, and just kind of categorizing everybody in one umbrella and smashing them. But these things are going to continue coming into the surface because for too long, for almost 500 years, for some of us, we've been oppressed by, 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 by these systems. 
that unfortunately were, 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 were ran by a lot of Anglo-Saxon folks, you know, uh, and no, no disrespect to, 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 to our white relatives because I have a lot of white people uh, that are my friends that are community members that are pushing just as hard as a black and brown person. So big shout out to, to, to our white allies who are in the fight, those attorneys that show up, those intellectuals that have the different components that us from the grassroots level sometimes might lack and they might lack the perspective that we bring. And so collectively, that's what these spaces you know, bring, you know, working together and uh, decarcerating our communities and uh, and uh, uh, focusing more on providing alternatives instead of incarceration. So, you know, again, it's the funding, but, uh, you know, we will continue fighting it. And I've had to uh, pull back from actually community healing and mentoring. As a matter of fact, I just went back into the school system to start this, the, the work again in there, but because we need, we need to, if we, if we ain't changing the system and the way these policies are governing these people that work for these systems, we can mentor the hell out of the poor youngster, but he's still going to get suspended. He's still going to get over criminalized. He's still going to be, you know, not fully supported in the traumas and the cultural sensitive areas that they have. And, and all these different factors that only people of color, people impacted by those same factors would understand if they had the funding and the support to, to develop new models to counter uh, 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 abolish these, these systems of oppression and white supremacy. Thank you all so much. I am at a loss of words because there's so many different thoughts that are running through my head, but I think two of the biggest things that pop up from the responses that you all just shared is systems. I think that being the first is how do we impact systems, but also, you know, back to Melissa, your first initial point around funding, and I know that that's something that's been common across all the panelists, is resources. It goes beyond even just showing up and representation. It's like, hey, we're already at a disadvantage when we show up in any of these spaces. And then we're trying to figure out what do our resources look like? And then trying to impact people and trying to mentor people with those lack of resources is another conversation that really needs to be at the forefront because who is funding us? And we're already, I mean, speaking of oppressive structures, we're already at that disadvantage. And so as we further progress in our careers, in our spaces, that's also a conversation that needs to continue to be at the forefront because we all know, yes, we're in this freaking capitalistic society that we live in that funding and money as a resource is really important to any of the structures that we build, any of the things that we're trying to go ahead and actually enact, you know, and, and when we really think about the people that we're impacting, I think that is something that I really appreciate that you all brought up because it is the realities of the world that we live in. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't talk about that. They just say, oh, you showed up or you got to this position. You should be proud. You're the first insert here at this institution or in this position. It's like, yes, thank you. And where are my resources? And how can I also continue to build and not just build community, but build these foundational systems, these new foundational systems that are going to be able to impact these people, people like us who also deserve to be in these spaces and not just one of 50, one of 100, one of 500. It's how do we bring more people like ourselves into these spaces that equally, if not more at times, deserve to be in these spaces and utilizing our voices. So thank you all for showing, um, for just sharing all of your responses. So on to the next question. Here at Scholars of Color, we want to inspire people to be the change they want to see. And so how and why do you consider yourself an agent of change? I'm definitely looking forward to this response. I think all of you are agents of change, hence why you're here. Um, so this time, we'll go ahead and actually start off with Henry, and then we'll just continue to popcorn over to the next person. Well, you know what? Um, I had no to, no choice but to become a freaking agent of change. It was just so much crap, uh, you know, so much injustice from, uh, you know, going losing my whole childhood basically. Well, my my young years, right? I, uh, uh, through the system and being so angry, so bitter, so full of rage, and ready to just fire up on anybody that disrespected me. Because that's how we were raised. We we're, we're raised in the war zone. We're, we're raising and we're zones where we're losing our lives left and right. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, I, I, I went through a lot of violence from, you know, getting chased by numerous, you know, you know, it's like tribal wars. Right. We get labeled as gang members, but it's, it's just tribal stuff. You know what I'm saying? And and uh, all we know is our tribal nature, uh, you know, the beliefs that are shaped based on bad experiences and pain and trauma. 
And like, we don't have fathers. My father left me when I was five. So that turned in a lot of rage that I didn't know I had. So I, 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 I right away gravitated to the older homeboys who embraced me, who schooled me. And, and you know what I'm saying? And we get caught up in, 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 in seeking these uh, human needs like uh, love, attention, uh, gratification, you know, uh, and, and, and so you get it from, from committing uh, violence and crime in the community for, for the name of the neighborhood. And so, you know, all these things, you know, I was seeing we're, we're mass flow of us were ending up in prison. And a lot of times, you know, we would be drinking our, our prison made uh, alcohol, Pruno, you know what I'm saying, or doing what we would do and, and, and having conversations. I always would engage people in, and people uh, conversations to get to understand their past, you know, their insanity, their pain, their beauty, all that, right? As we process, right? And, and you know, a lot of people would break down in these spaces. Uh, you know, you would see, you know, the torture, or torturous childhoods that some of these kids went through, uh, some of these men went through as kids. And, 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 and so, you know, over time, I started reading, I started educating myself. I started going on a journey of self-exploration, of healing, and they didn't really have too much programs. They had these little mental health programs of these white clinicians, but you don't understand my life. You've never been a day in my freaking shoes, homeboy. You know what I'm saying? How are you going to tell me with all these clinical pills that are just, I'm a guinea pig. These ain't FDA approved. You know, I'm still a guinea pig with these medications and, and you're going to put that through my liver, kidneys and, 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 and have me all, you know, discombobulated mentally. And that's what we do, they were doing to a lot of our people in there. And so, you know, I had to really search for to find, uh, you know, uh, you know, relationship with creator as always. But in, that was my my main motivator. But also, you know, uh, engaging in different spaces and engaging these dialogues where people would just start speaking their truths, and we would encourage each other to really learn and start uh, developing these these, these trans formational uh, uh, reflections and and that over time changed our beliefs. When our beliefs changed, our emotions were processed, they were able to heal. Our human needs to be loved and validated were fulfilled by being in space with other people who also went through what we went through. And over time, you know, that, that subconsciously shaped our behavior and uh, we made better choices and uh, we transformed and, and uh, are now productive members, uh, brothers, sisters, uh, uh, sons, uh, leaders, uh, you know, mentors to this community. And so, you know, I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I do the work because it, it was needed. Nobody was doing it. Uh, there's not enough people of color doing it. There's not enough Chicanos in the spaces that I'm in doing it at times. And and so, some, uh, you know, I, I sometimes feel like I neglect my own people because I, I, I try to look at it as an inclusive lens, you know, even though in some spaces, some people just look out for their own people, you know what I'm saying? And I, I understand that it's a cutthroat world and and and, and some, some, some cultures have been disenfranchised more, more than others. But when you look at different components, you know, it's worse for some other people than, than, than others. I mean, imagine being kidnapped from the country you've been here since you were one or two, three years old, and now you're getting deported to this country that you you, you were born in. But that's all. You were never, you know, there or, or you know, be, be, being, being, oh, oh, you know, uh, over incarcerated with massive amounts of life sentences with no hope, with no future of ever getting out. And so these are, these are the realities we face every day. And this is this is why I'm, I'm here to to serve and to be in space and to support anytime I can. So with that, I'll make space for our, 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 our speakers. All right, Henry, thank you so much. And feel free to choose someone from the rest of the panelists. Okay, I'm going to choose, um, let me see. Uh, uh, the, 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 let me see the, uh, well, I was going to say Daniel, but I don't want to play that Chicano card. I'm going to choose uh, Melissa. What's up, Melissa? Uh, sprinkle me with some wisdom. What's up, Henry? You speaking to my whole life right now. So thank you so much. Uh, for myself, it took me a really long time to find liberation, a really, really, really long time. I'm like, free your mind, right? From these ideas of what and how you're supposed to live and be and what is success and what is perfection. And I went through a, a series in my life where I feel like I needed to be like family. I needed to be like uh, professional mentors. I needed to be like folks I saw on TV. And then much like to what Henry said, you realize they've never lived my life. They don't understand my capacity. They don't have my vision or insight. They don't have my creativity. They weren't giving me the divine nature in the way that I move around the world. So how could I assume this idea of success or professionalism from someone that has never been me? Never. And they never will be. And so I didn't even realize I was reducing my capacity, right, to, to, to let somebody else tell me who I was supposed to be. How dangerous is that? It's so dangerous, especially for folks that are built in racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and capitalism. That's dangerous. 
right? To give you that kind of power and autonomy over the way in which I'm supposed to, you know, navigate this world. So once I found liberation, which for me was very recent, three years ago, that was it for me. That was it. And that's when I knew that I had uh, not only a desire, but a destiny, a purpose and intention to make space for myself so I can visibly show others what liberation looks like for folks. I call them all my chocolate girls that are like me, that have backgrounds like me, that look like me, that talk like me, that understand the way in which I move in the world. But then also for the elders that have been waiting for me to find my power, who work so hard to give me space. I mean, talking life or death, much like Dr. Kat was talking about, life or death decisions so that I can even have the ability to have a choice to be able to walk into purpose. So how dare I sit back and stay in insecurity? How dare I sit back and say that I don't deserve or that I should be doubtful about anything? How dare I when generations of folks have sacrificed life or death decision making for me to even be on Zoom right now with all of you to say these are the things that I'm doing, that these are the things that are non-negotiable for me. These are the ways in which I'm going to show up and conquer my time here on this planet because none of us know when our clock is up. None of us. It doesn't matter what your age is. None of us know. And it is a privilege and a pleasure to make it to our elder years. You hear me? A privilege and a pleasure. And a lot of people will denounce their power based on age because they'll say, I'm still too young. I have so much to learn. I have so many years to go. You don't know that. You don't know that. So it's really important to activate and stand in your power right now. Absolutely right now. I mean, absolutely right now because you don't know. And so for me, I didn't want to take any more time for granted because time is the biggest gift that all, the biggest gift that all of us have. I didn't want to take it for granted anymore because I realized I had been looking up and saying, oh, in five years, I'll be ready. In 10 years, I'll be ready. If I get this position, I'll be ready. I'll be smarter. I'll be capable. I'll be uh, affirmed, right? I'll be blue checked. But in reality, like I said before, I was already born. I was already born ready and capable. So um, that's what makes me a change agent. And I've used that same energy to impact so many lives to get into whatever they wanted to do. Start businesses, get into grad school, you know, start a doctoral program, uh, drop out of college, you know, all of those things to really pursue what life has to offer. And I'm very proud of all of those ways I've I'm just impacted folks. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I have listened to the divine, listened to my mind, my body, my spirit, and tell me, hey, this is destiny and it's time to lean into it. So I hope other folks understand that energy too. It's important work and you don't need anybody else to confirm your vision, just you and that's it. Oh, I messed up. I didn't say, I didn't pick somebody, Michael. Don't be mad, don't be mad. Okay, 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 okay. Dr. Kat, what's up? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna stop me in tears. Um, I, you know, this was, this was hard because I think, you know, we all think of change agents as catalysts, right? Um, you know, successful change agents improve the ability to successfully create it with individuals at all different levels, right? Whether organizational level, community level, we really want to achieve a higher degree of output, right? When I was kind of growing up and kind of going through the process of understanding where I am, my sense of belonging, who I can kind of attach to, who I belong to. There were so many different groups. It was always a person of color, but it was never my color in a sense. We're, we're an invisible shade. I was never light enough. I was never dark enough. Um, I'm sitting here saying, okay, well, who do I identify with? There's really no one there to kind of help you. There's no mentor. There's no guidance. There's no outreach. You're kind of there doing it yourself. There's an isolation, right? As time went on, I noticed that didn't decrease. It just continued. And you always look for someone, you look around and you go, well, who could be like me? You know, there's, there's really no that one person. I started thinking, okay, well, there's two things, fear, right? We have two things. Either you forget it, you forget everything and you run, or you face everything and you rise. So I had to face my fears and say, even if I'm by myself, even if I am alone, I'm going to be that agent. I'm going to allow people to see who I am, where I come from, change that stigma, right? You see things, you see the news, I've had people tell me, oh my God, I've never even met an Afghan person except what I saw on the news. You know, oh my God, you speak English so well. How do you even speak? There's no accent. You know, all these different stereotypes, stigmas that you come across. It's really wanting to change all of that and show people that we're just so much more than what you see in the media. You know, and also use media to give voice, right? There's outputs now and outlets that we're using 
to use social media platforms to raise awareness, you know, whether it be through do not touch my clothes, kiss my heels, you know, things that we're raising awareness now and making people understand that we're so much more than what you see. We bring so much more to the table. I don't want to be tokenized. That's happened a lot, especially with everything going on in the news now. Now, all of a sudden, my institutions, all my partners, organizations are like, hey, Kat, do you mind speaking on this? Do you mind being a pioneer? We'd like to be a frontier. So we'd like to partner with, where were you through the entire process? Where were you when I was trying to rise and thrive and be that person and get where I needed to? You weren't there, but now you want to piggyback on who I am and where I come from. But as everyone has said thus far, as Henry and Melissa has mentioned, you don't know me. You don't know my lived experience. You don't know what I've been through. So how am I going to allow you to now add on to that and be a part of that? You can hear me. You can maybe possibly later be a part of that, but you're never going to get to be me or really truly understand any of it. And so I want to be able to give back to those same individuals who, like me, feel invisible, who don't don't get to be heard or don't get to be seen because, again, we're lumped up under a category of AAPI. And we, we're not disaggregated. So are you ever going to see me? If I check Mark Asian, do you really see me for who I am or what I go through and what I'm going to need? No. So I want to be able to be that change. And sometimes it's going to take that one person that kind of just stands up and says, here's the face of it. Here's who I'm trying to represent. I'm not speaking on all the community, but just see me and then maybe you'll see the rest. And so for me, that's why I would want to be an agent of change is I'm hoping to change and break that stigma and stereotype of what we've come across or what we've been seeing in the past 20, 30, 40 years, or however long we've been shown on that map, right? Typically, you won't know where we come from until you hear of a war and you see us on the map in a news, you know, in a news article or something like that. So to really be seen and heard and be seen more than just as a war-torn immigrant who came to this country and now is trying to make it there's so much more to us and so much more we bring to the table. So I hope that that will allow me to make that impact and inspire others. So I appreciate that. With that, I will go over to Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Kat. Thank you all the panelists, Michael. Um, I think for me, it was like, um, in many ways having to trailblaze in the different facets of my life, like being the first to go to college and understand what the fuck like higher ed is to like trying to figure out my major and then connect with academic mentors. So like, it took a lot of, um, yes, like personal will, but also like trusting the process and trusting that there are people um, who are looking out for me. Cause I did come from a very background where I was like, can I trust these people? Like, do they really have their best interest um, in mind? Or is it just like something that stamps on their label and their level of status, right? And so like those stress issues were super real. I goes, that went with friends, peers, I went with like mentors. Um, to like being the first to go to therapy, especially as someone identifies you know, as a man and understanding like um, how to process my emotions in a healthy way. And of course, yes, art's the creative way to do that. But I think more so how, how, how can I process grief? How am I giving myself space to process grief? Um, knowing that grief is not something to uh, be ashamed of, right? Processing shame as well. Um, and so those pieces are also like really help with the wellness piece. Um, and then also, you know, on, on the music angle, right? Like being the first um, in the family that, like I found out my grandfather played guitar and he was in a little trio, you know, with, with his friends um, when he was young. And to me, that was beautiful. I'm like, oh, there is like a music history in the family. But, you know, when, when my cousin and I were working on establishing ourselves as emerging artists, um, it was able to open those conversations and those doors to be like, we value ourselves and our worth and our art enough that, we deserve to be seen, we deserve to be heard. And that took a lot from someone who, who grew up more passive aggressive, who, who viewed conflict as something to avoid, right? To be like, no, like I have messages that are important and that should be heard and that should be shared, right? Because I'm hearing a lot of other things that is like opposite or feels is just like, just, just, just different, right? Um, and knowing that as Melissa was saying, right? Like time is of the essence and I'm gonna take matters of control in my hands. So I'm gonna, I have to be like, sure, I don't have a manager yet. But I'm gonna be my own manager and push push the music and push the art. Um, but in the ways that like, of course the divine always works is that it connects you with the right people and the times you don't even know it. It'd be like, oh, that makes sense why like this and this didn't happen. Now I'm sharing it in this platform. Oh, well, it's great. Like people are now like sharing, sharing the music and now collaborating with other creatives. And I think that's where I'm at right now is like, I've done the work, I, I know I know how to, make music and all that. But now now spirit is like, okay, great. Now you gotta learn how to collaborate. 
And now you got to release ego and think you, you, you can't do it all, right? So learn how to collaborate, especially in this world where we're so connected digitally. Um, there are people who, can, who you know, really, uh, really support you. And of course, trusting that intuition, because I'm still going through like working through trust issues. Like that's an ongoing process, right? Still going through like, what is the healing process looks like? like? Damn, I thought I was already healed. Like I went through this bullshit like three years ago and I'm like, well, I feel good. And then one day you're like, boom, like, oh, depression just hit. I just want to stay in my bed. I'm watching Avatar Last Airbender. And that's okay, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, what am I going to take notes about? Okay, Uncle Arrow said like, there's the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, just know that the, you got to keep going. You don't see it yet, but keep going. And I always think about that whenever I'm feeling like, whew, I'm just trapped in these shadows, but I'm not I'm moving past it. Hey, brother, what kind of music you play, carnal? Real quick, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're good. I do alternative hip hop. Um, a lot of our first album is very like OG boom bap style, and I'll do progress in, the, in our style and music. Um, very versatile, so definitely drop our Spotify and Apple music in the chat. Love you can play it to, to the folks you work with. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone. And Daniel is freaking amazing, so please, please check out his music. It's, it, I mean, beyond it just being something that sounds good, it really is also really healing. And I think that's that's the the word that was like screaming out as I heard each of you speak is healing. Like there's so much trauma. There's so much trauma. I mean, whether it be our own or folks like our parents, our grandparents that maybe never got the chance to actually even process through their grief or their trauma or even understand that that's actually what they're experiencing. There's so much work, so much healing work. And Daniel, I couldn't help but like laugh in the background when you said like, I thought I was done healing because that's that is the thing where it's like you get to this point and then boom, the universe is like, oh, you thought you were done? No, it's not. It's, it's not done. It's not anywhere near done. But I think that is the beauty that speaks to, you know, I mean, Melissa starting us off with saying like, you know, we're we're not promised time like we really aren't. And that's something that I personally have been really navigating is being more present in the time that we're actually in with the people that we get to actually even get to interact with. It's so powerful that you also mentioned, you know, all of you did even that connection to a higher power, you know, whatever you believe in, but that, that divine power that exists that helps to guide us, whether that be your intuition or a deity that you believe in, but that belief system. And that's something that really makes me happy as I talk to more and more scholars of color is that there is some sort of connection to understanding that there's something beyond us and that's so powerful because that also connects to faith and what we're able to go ahead and do for ourselves, but also for other people. So I appreciate you all bringing up the healing and the mental health aspect to this all, right? Because so many of us, like probably all of us could resonate with the amount of work that we put in and then also sometimes forget to take care of ourselves. And eventually that either catches up mentally, physically, spiritually, or all the above. And I, it's something that I learned very early on in my career when I broke down and I finally had like my moment, which is, oh, crap, I really can't do it all as much as I want to advocate for everyone and myself and be a part of these committees and do all these things like I really can't if I'm not taking care of myself. And I appreciate you all sharing that piece because it's so important as we talk to people that are inspired by our stories and they're like, I want to do this too, or I want to join this group. I want to join this committee. I want to lead this, 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 and that. And that's wonderful. And we need all the help, but also people need to tend to their well being. And I think I re that's something that really resonated with, you know, a, a larger theme of this conversation. So thank you all for sharing that. So we're going to go ahead and actually go into our last question before we go into our next section of the presentation and the panel. So last question here is what impact do you want to make in this world and how can scholars of color help you achieve it? So we'll go ahead and start off with Dr. Kat this time. Oh, good grief. Okay. Um, you know what, this one, this one's hard because, you know, obviously I want to impact the world, right? I want to impact students of color, scholars of color, people and of all different races, ethnicities by telling our story, right? By, by being present and making our voices heard, everyone has a unique story, right? And I want those to be heard. Um, and I think that's when we're the most impactful is when we get to tell our story. We're not a quantitative you know, story. I think you really have to be there and speak on it. Um, as someone in education, I think it's important when we think about it, who are the stakeholders we're trying to serve, right? It's a daunting task for all of us to take that feat on and say, you know, we're going to be the pioneer. We're going to be the forefront. And that fight that you're trying to do, 
you know, whether it be conducting the research, like we talked about, publishing work, hosting events, webinars, being, you know, the focal point of disseminating the work through platforms to make things to come to fruition. At the end of the day, the problem is, or the, the concern is that we can identify the problem, but it's a cyclical event if we're not able to come up with ways to fix or correct or, you know, change everything that's going on, right? And I think that's that's the hardest part, is framing it in a way that we can confirm existing research or conversations, posing solutions and recommendations for the issue at hand, right? I hear a lot about, you know, being an advocate, be an ally, let's have the conversation, but what happens after that? That's, that's what I wanna see come to fruition. I wanna see things change. And I think it's great that we can speak on it, whether it be at the individual level, the state level, the local level, the national level, but we really have to have those individuals in place to really make that change, whether it be funding, you know, whether it be policies, uh, policy makers, whatever it may be, there's so much to it that we need, the conversations. Um, you know, I think there's so much to make as far as an impact. And I think we're just at the forefront of it all. I think we're a generation where we're really truly setting the trend and I hope as time goes on, like Melissa said, you know, we never know what our time's gonna be up, right? So I move it on and pass the torch over to the next individual who will take that story, that conversation and add to it, build to it till it makes that major impact, right? Um, I think that Scholars of Color has been a beautiful platform for me to actually feel a sense of family and belonging of other individuals who have gone through the trauma, who have gone through the experience, who have gone through everything that it is to be a scholar of color, right? Um, you know, you have that indivisibility for so long and then to finally be able to have that place where you can say, wow, someone else gets me. That's, that's made the biggest impact. And to be able to use that platform to help another person who might also hear it and say, you know, that's just like me. Wow, I feel like I have a place that I can belong to. I think that's, that's the major reason why I've been a part of this and I'm blessed to be a part of such a great community. And I hope that, Others join in on the conversation and add to it and just continues to build on so that everyone truly does feel heard, seen, and feel a sense of belonging if they really don't. So I appreciate that. And I will pass it over to, I'll go over to Daniel. Thank you, Kat. And I just wrote down exactly what you said. Um, like, wow, someone else gets me. Um, and that's why I do the music, right? Like to write and create from a vulnerable place. Um, so when someone hears it, they're like, oh, when I was down in the dumps, like I wasn't the only one. And one of my favorite artists is Kid Cudi, a big mental health advocate. Um, and how he talks about how the main reason why he does his music is to, yes, not, not only help others not feel alone, but prevent especially young teens from committing suicide. Um, and I know when I, when I was young and I was a teen and I was going through my things, I had that ideation, but I never acted on it. Um, and so I know that when you, as an artist and as a creative, right, like you can have so much ideas or imaginations of who you're supposed to be, when and where, how, or the opposite of not fully um, valuing and loving yourself um, because of the externals, right? And so the reason why I, I push for and do the music is just to really, again, write from, a, from an honest place but um, an artist, uh, actually, um, Coolio from Gangster's Paradise, he met my parents in Vegas um, just casually. And he showed, uh, my parents showed them uh, one of our music videos. And he was like, they got to keep doing what they're doing. But the advice I have is to, um, and this is, goes for any art, right? Is to document all the human emotions you have, right? So not, like, first of all, like my cousin and I were like, we're just writing sad boy stuff because this is what we're going through, depression. Right, but I take that and be like, as a human, I have the spectrum of emotions and I should be able to document that whether it's a visual, whether it's music, whether it's et cetera, um, and to put that out there and to be like, this is what it means to be full. This is what it means to, to embody all of my humanity. And that we hope that everyone else is able to tap into whatever wavelength or energy that they're at or to raise it if that's what they're looking for. And I'll pass it on to Henry. All right, yeah. 
I think the question was uh, what what impact we want to make, right? And how can uh, you know scholars help us? I think uh, the impact the impact is already being having made, and it will continue uh, being made. And we're we didn't start this. This has started from way back. You know what I'm saying? From all the way from the Noche Triste when the Aztecas try to you know rush the the, the Spaniards to try to fight for back for our land and and keep our women and our kids from getting hurt when we were getting conquered and, 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 you know, we let our religion uh, blind us and, 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 and got massacred and, 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 and became what we became, right. The mestizo, the mixed people, not by, by, by choice, but by force. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of us carry that rage, that trauma. Uh, uh, I know in the Chicano communities of California, we have, we have some of the most violent people and, and, and you know, in, in we're 44% of the people incarcerated, and and you know people are not realizing the system. Any a lot of people are not realizing we we've been suffering from a mental health crisis and a public health crisis because we're 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 living in insanity in our communities. And so there's just all this madness, just trauma triggering trauma, and then you 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 incarcerate us in these cages and expect us to get better. The system didn't make us better. The changes in the healing that I found it didn't, it didn't come from the system. It came from creator. It came from my peers. It came from us wanting to seek better, whether it was through litigating, whether it was through, you know, uh, different different altercations, riots sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Situations get crazy and sometimes you got to get cracking and violence is the only resort uh, in order to get peace. You know what I'm saying? And that's how we were raised. And so there was a jungle life. And and so, like, I don't I don't I don't, I don't think that any human being should have to go through uh, uh, such a jungle life all the way from when you're having to be stripped against your wheel squat and cough like we're already dehumanized off the top just coming into the county jails when we're already arrested or when we're getting pulled over on gunpoint right just because you're on the car that at the most you probably smoke some weed right we weren't even gang banging this night ain't gonna put all this whole scene so like every night we are terrorized every night uh there's a lot of a lot of brown on brown black on brown vice versa or cop on community violence or cop on uh on terrorizing communities through incarceration through cps systems to probation to parole and it's like my my, my whole mission is, is is to fight for for the liberation of our people for justice for 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 our land you know and for liberty and that's going to take uh, abolishing some of these systems and developing new models and developing new scholars uh, uh, with, with, with new innovative uh, ways uh, and, and having a collective discussion to change uh, the system of white supremacy that's been instituted in our, uh, in our land and in uh, and, and our philosophy and our religion and, and in our culture and in our communities every day, not by choice, but by force. So we definitely need to be, uh, uh, if we're a multicultural country now, we need to uplift all the different beauty that we have in this freaking country now. After all this massacre, we have to uh, uplift everybody and allow everybody to have an equal playing field to produce equity for, for their businesses, uh, to, to run for, for positions and to be elected, to decriminalize our records. Once you've done your time, should be able to close that record and be able to run and, and, and be restored to the 2,800 uh, state rights that we lose, that I still don't have, even though I'm off of parole. You know what I'm saying? So, so that, that, and the way the scholars can help me is by getting involved. We need, whether it's voter registration, whether it's helping with legal health clinic to decriminalize people, whether it's showing up to court with the young people to get decriminalize them and, and get them out of those systems or, or just advocating at the Capitol, on the community, showing up to, to the spaces, to our meetings on Zoom, membership calls, uh, you know, legal legal research, you know what I mean? Participatory defense trainings, grassroots organizing trainings. I mean, there's a lot of ways that people can show up and, and we need to start showing up. It, it is our duty and our responsibility to fight for our freedom. So that's, I'll end it with that. Hey, echame un grito, carnal, because I shoot that shit también. And, and, and uh, let's, 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 I want to scope out some of your music, homeboy. And that leaves Melissa. I love all the support. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's important. Uh, the question is about impact. I want to show folks that living my life naturally is enough. I think there's so many things that tell us in the world that we have to assume more and do more and be more and accrue more. I need to have all these different things to be deemed someone that has done something in the world when in reality... I'm enough right here, right now, I'm enough. 
And for people of color, we've been fighting since we were born, right? We've been literally fighting these systems, these ideals, the ways in which to navigate the world. And for a lot of us, we're exhausted. And I'll say for myself, I'm exhausted some days. Some days I'm like, y'all are really lucky that I decided to attend a meeting. Y'all are lucky that I decided to submit a vote. Y'all are really lucky that I decided to go to a rally. Y'all are really lucky that I did that because for a number of us, we don't get to rest. We don't get to do that. And we will literally break ourselves down all the way down thinking that we have to do this by ourselves. So I just want to reiterate, like my impact is to live life full of joy, you know, show up where I can, but also show that what I'm doing is enough. What I'm doing is enough. Um, as someone that has served on countless committees and councils and administrative action initiatives and diversity initiatives and all these different ways to show up for folks, sometimes I forget that I myself am human, that I too need a vacation, that I too need good sleep, that I too need a chance to actually eat good food and spend time with my wife and make sure that my family is sustainable. And so I just want to empower those to that are in positions of authority and that are fighting the good fight to remember that what you're doing is in fact enough. And our job is to empower other folks to find their lane in this fight. So that way they can show up and recognize that their life has value and is meaningful. So they too can realize that they are enough. So that's really what I want to show the world is that we are, like I said, from the very beginning, we are capable. We have all that we need and that in this life, you are already worthy and enough. Love that. And yes, yes, we are all more than capable and definitely worthy enough. Thank you all for just sharing this experience and for just providing such a freaking powerful panel experience. I think to be able to hear your personal stories makes it that much more meaningful to be able to see beyond just something that we read in an article or that we come across on social media. It makes it that much more impactful when we actually hear from each other and find ways to support each other. And I'm loving all this support going on in the chat and just throughout the whole experience here that you all have been providing for each other. Thank you for that. I know, Melissa, that you have to head out a little bit earlier. So I want to go ahead and just make sure that folks know that Melissa's contact information will be on at the very end. So you can go ahead and also check that out. But if anyone does need to go ahead and head out early, all that information also can be found on our social media channels. But we're going to go ahead and transition into the last part of our presentation. Melissa, thank you so much. Have fun. So thank you, Anna. Feel free to play it when you can. And this is Andre Sarate, and I am the founder of the Z Factor Project a brand focusing on my journey as a queer educator and leader of color on the path to self-love, self-acceptance, joy, and coming back home to myself. I am so excited to share a piece of what I've been working on over the past two years and have it come into full fruition. It's called House of Legends. It is a labor of love, a healing and practice, and my personal passion project. I hope you learn a little bit about me and my intentions for the future. The first time I was called a faggot was in second grade, and I've heard it every single year after that. It stayed with me through middle school, high school, college, and even as an adult. My schooling systems made me believe that my mere existence was a mistake, troubling, and should be erased from history. This did not only affect my own self-esteem, confidence, and mental health over the years, but it also affected me in my learning spaces, early potential, and my academics. I was led to believe that people like me did not deserve to be here. People like me cannot thrive in any environment. People like me are meant to hide into obscurity and people like me aren't meant to lead. Now, I want you to think about someone close to you in your circle. It could be a sibling, another family member, a close friend, a colleague, a neighbor, a student who, who you may have let you into their lives over the years. What's their story? Are they living in their truest authentic power? Do you know if their schooling systems and environments empowered them to be themselves? Unfortunately, these same thoughts and feelings about LGBTQ students still exist in the fabric of our public schools today. According to Glisten's 2019 National School Climate Survey, 59% of LGBTQ students felt unsafe at their schools to the point where 70% of them avoided school functions. Almost 98.8% .8 of LGBTQ students heard anti-LGBTQ remarks. 
that forced them to feel distressed. 86.3% also experienced harassment or assault based on their personal characteristics. Even on the heels of progressive legislation and new mandates for LGBTQ students, 59.1% of students still personally felt discriminatory policies and practices within their schools. As a result, students identifying as LGBTQ were dealing with the effects of victimization, discrimination, which included being three times more likely to miss school, have lower GPAs, possess lower self-esteem, and experience higher levels of depression. Many of students who would either transfer out or drop out, and this was amplified even further if you identified as Black, Indigenous, or a person of color. This has forced me to ask two very important questions for our children. One, who do our school systems effectively serve? And two, how can we create a safe, supporting, loving, and rigorous school environment for students who are looking to be accepted for who they are? My name is Andre Sarate and my pronouns are he, them. I am the child of two immigrants from the Philippines. I am gay and a very proud member of the LGBTQ plus community. I am actively moving towards my personal freedom and liberation. And I want to model authentic leadership and build schools where students can be exactly who they want to be without any restrictions. I want to create a world where people love themselves accept others as they come, and to use their passions to make an impactful contribution to the world in their own unique way. They are the leaders of their own lives. I am a brother, I am an educator, I am a leader, and I am an edupreneur. And over the past eight years, I've taught first grade, fifth grade, to eighth grade, and I've taught all subjects, including reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. I've shown a track record of success and excellence in teaching through the different awards I've received on a local, state, and national level. It is time that we take the next step for our students. We need to move beyond performative legislation in the form of curriculum mandates and support groups. We need to make sure that this safety and care is inclusive throughout the building from classroom to classroom. We need to do this for the person you thought about, your friends, your family member, your sibling, a colleague, neighbor, or even your former or current students. For students like me. Now, I want you to imagine a world where you can be authentic, be unapologetic, and be yourself. A place to create, challenge, share, and to be accepted. A place to honor your ancestors. And this is why I'm creating House of Legends. We strongly believe that the future and present is Black, the future and present is Brown, and the future and present is queer, trans, and non-binary. The future and present is our children. Our school is for everyone, but it centers the needs of students of color, particularly those who identify as LGBTQ+. We are unapologetically an LGBTQ safe school and will pride ourselves on being an abolitionist education program through focusing on an identity-centered curriculum, teaching through the lens of social justice, emphasizing holistic health, mind, body, and soul, cultivating their passions and zone of genius, pushing for student leadership, and they will continue to question, explore, research, and discuss through seminar style classes. Finally, they will take all that they learned to change their communities, the city, and the world. However, we need your help and support. For the rest of 2021 and through 2022, I am designating it as a planning year to continue prototyping, relationship building, and making different transitions. I would like support networking with other school leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs, especially with trying to revise and make the most of the innovative model for our students. I will also be applying for supplemental philanthropic funding. And in the spring of 2022, I want to launch a fundraising effort for $200,000 that will go towards early staffing, innovation school visits across the country, advertisements, prototyping plans and materials, recruitment and enrollment plans, planning support, professional development for the founder and the team. Any leads or supports would be helpful as we continue to design and launch. Alexander Leon once said that queer people don't grow up as ourselves. 
We grow up playing a version of ourselves that sacrifices authenticity to minimize humiliation and prejudice. The massive task of our adult lives is to unpick which parts of ourselves are truly us and which parts we've created to protect us. But it truly doesn't have to be this way. We shouldn't have to wait till we're 20 or 30 to love ourselves fully. We can start today and we can start now. We can start with our children. House of Legends Academy, legends thrive here. Will you join us and be legendary too? You can find more information with the contact information below. And thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. I'm gonna go ahead and actually ask Anna to go ahead and jump on over to the contact slides. So, and that way, if you all wanna go ahead and take a picture of the contact information of the folks that were involved, that way you can go ahead and contact them. So you can take a snapshot, you can take a picture on your phone. But I would like to also just take this opportunity to thank all the people that were part of the panel today. You all are just amazing, wonderful human beings. And I just wanna thank you for all of your effort, for all of the work that you put in day in and day out. And I also, speaking to a theme that was brought up earlier, I hope that you also get a chance to invest in yourself as much as you can to rest, to take the time that you need to also just center yourself in the work that you do, because you're impacting so many, so many people. And I know that just speaking on uh, speaking on behalf of myself, I appreciate the work. I can only imagine how many people that you all are just touching their lives and really able to go ahead and just create a positive impact in their lives. So thank you for that. Um, on I think on that note, I think it was it the last slide here on that. Go ahead and so this is our contact information if any of you want to go ahead and also be part of the scholars of color platform and be showcased please let us know this is our website we're also on instagram so you can go ahead and follow us there and then you are also more than welcome to go ahead and email us if there's any follow-up questions or if you just want to get involved there's a lot of opportunities this is our first ever event as i mentioned earlier there's going to be many more to come we're also hoping to go ahead and eventually launch scholarships for students do some more fundraising opportunities. Um, and as Henry mentioned, to really show up in a lot of those spaces that were needed. And so that's gonna take effort, that's gonna take coordination, that's gonna take a lot of dedication, but I think we have the right people. And the fact that we have 100 plus people that make up this platform, and it's still in its beginning stages, is just that much more inspiring to know because there's so many more people that are going to be part of this. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and actually transition us to our last slide, which is our acknowledgements. I wanna go ahead and just say thank you again to our panelists and to the Z Factor Project for just helping to be part of this event. Our interns, Ana Dios and Isalia Zumaya, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our graphic designer, Empathic Vibrations, for creating our flyer, um, as well as Mama's Protection Products. And of course, the folks that make up the Scholars of Color community, thank you so much for being part of this event. I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your night. I think some of you are even on the East Coast, so thank you for joining us. It's about to be 10 p.m. over there. Um, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if anyone wants to go ahead and ask any questions, but that is a wrap. So thank you so much for showing up, and I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thanks, everyone.